Okay guys, so we're now going to try this this morning for a third time. So last night, and you'll see as I post the beginning of the video, um, this morning here in a second on Canvas, that not only did I try to do the third or second PowerPoint for the Cold War not once, but twice, and my pa first time my PowerPoint, or my computer, the dog pulled out the power cable, and it died. Second time, it just pure sketched out. So, I've already done this PowerPoint for two hours, twice, and neither video is playable, because <laughs> one time, the, the what save will not play. So now we're going to do this lecture for a third time this morning. Don't you love my lovely pajamas? I'm just saying. Um, hopefully this gets through. So if I can get three-fourths of the way through, considering I've already done this twice, if I can get to where I want to get to, which is about... 50, which is about 90% of the way through the lecture. I'm just going to stop, put it on Canvas for you, and put the last few slides up on your Canvas page for you, because at this point I'm paranoid. Just plain paranoid. So, anywho, with that stated, we're going to go ahead and conclude Chapter 27. Hopefully this time it sticks, it stays, it works. Um, but that way you will have everything we need for the week. Uh, my hybrid classes will now have both World War II PowerPoint and Cold War at their disposal for their quiz next week. So, anywho, here we go. Let's try and finish this up this time. So we started with... Well, we will start with where we picked up twice last night, which is after the election of 1948, which is or which was the biggest presidential upset ever in American history. Right? Ruby. Uh-uh. Which was the presidential said No one thought Truman had a shot in hell of winning, right? No one thought he had a freaking shot. Everyone thought Dewey had it in the bag. But as we did see, Truman came on top. He did things right. He did things the right way. He did things according. And he should have been the winner. Because let's be honest. If Dewey had been elected, Dewey would have been the puppet. But those in his party, in the Republican Party, would have been the string masters, right? Dewey was just not strong enough to stand up on his own, as we did in fact see. So, Truman wins, but he doesn't even have long to revel in a union, a union. <laughs> he doesn't have long to revel in a presidential victory. Ruby, quit. Lay down. In a rebel victory, due to the fact that pretty quickly upon winning his, a term in his own right, Things are going to start to transpire in the country of Germany. And I already have all my little maps I drew for you last night, so we're just going to pull these back up. They're backwards, I think, on the computer. Go with me. But long story short, after... So, the Berlin airlift. After... Excuse me for just one moment. See, we are in real lifetime. Shadow, do not drink that. Let's pick one. No. See? Real time, people. Okay. <laughs> I've been painting and my cat was drinking the nasty paint water. It's like I have a whole bowl of water, fresh water right over there. Anyway, I digress. So Germany, after the end of World War II and the Treaty of Paris, Germany had been split into flurps between the four big world powers that had won World War II. France, Britain, Russia, and the United States. So each country got their own portion of Germany to rule to control the way they saw fit, which it turns out each of them also gained a portion of Berlin. So, this is not geographically correct. Usually I have a whiteboard back here that I can draw on for you, and I can, you know, draw my little map and have all my little things, etc, etc. Not so much. So for right now, Germany is split into floors. Britain, Russia, France, United States, well Berlin, basically all of them controlling a portion of, well, in our little map, Berlin is smack dab in the middle. Again, not geographically correct. For the space of my resources, go with me. Right? <laughs> so, and each country had ruled their fourth the way they did see, you know, deemed fit. Um, however, after, with well, the start of the Cold War, Russia is ruling their portion of Germany as a communist country. People are being held to about 900 calories a day, all decisions are being made for them, etc., so on and so forth. And especially with the Cold War in full swing, you know, Stalin's plan of a world of friendly, friendly communism, all the other allied powers, I mean, uh, France is on our side, Britain is on our side of containment, 
containing communism where it is and stopping it from spreading anywhere else, right? So it's the so considering the situation, considering Russia now has a chance to turn this portion of Germany into a communist country, the other three countries, France, Britain, and the United States, decide in Germany to join their powers together. Right? They're gonna be the the present day you know Avengers. They're gonna join their powers together and they're going to lift the borders between their countries, right? So this border is, will be gone, and this border will be gone. Long story short, they're going to combine their three portions of Germany into one. And they're going to name it, they're going to rule it as a one united front. One united country by the name, and it's back where they can't ever make it go right on there, Bizonia. B-I-Z-O-N-I-A. I don't know why it's always backwards and when I do it this way. Anyway, it's almost like a mirror. Anywho, so they're going to have, so Russia's still going to have their little fourth, as you see. The other three countries are going to have, you know, roll theirs together as a group. And they're going to call the country Bazonia. Russia doesn't like this, however. Russia is going to feel ganged up on, right? So they say two can play that game. Where's my other map? This one has, I might have to draw another one, because this one has writing from all of our discussion last night on it. They're going to rule their own, I need something to run on. Where's my picture? Picture slash whiteboard. So they're going to choose. They say two can play that game. Oh, crap. Real time, people. Real time. We're going to make this work. Okay. So we've got the country of Germany. We have Bizonia. Now, if you ask me, these names are backwards. I think they should have been named, considering what we're fixing to see, Russia decide, is going to name their little portion of Germany. I think the name should be backwards myself, but you know, I'm, not, I'm older than that look. I am almost 40. Um, good God, I'm almost 40. But, I am not as old, you know, I'm not this old, so I wasn't there. But now we're going to have Bizonia, and we're going to have Trizone, T-R-I-Z-O-N-E. It's backwards when I do it, show it to you guys. It's going to drive me crazy. But, they're going to form, or Russia is going to turn their little portion of Germany into their own little country and rule it as a communist country. Not only that, Russia has to or Russia decides that they're going to cut Trizone. Oh, hello, Shadow. They're going to cut Trizone off completely from the rest of Germany. As in, no, as all trains will not be able to enter. No car can enter by road. They're going to completely put soldiers at every road access. They're going to have soldiers at every railroad station, every railroad entrance. Long story short, they're going to block off all road, road entrance into Trizone. Nobody can get in, and nobody can get out, right? The problem is, the people who live in this portion of Germany are the victims here, right? They have no say. They have no control over, you know, they didn't get to pick what country got to you know, rule the area where they lived. They were told what was going to happen, right? And especially when Russia fences off and blocks all interest into their portion. The problem is most people in Trizone rely on buying goods brought in to this portion of Germany to live on. Food, medicine, supplies. It is usually brought in by train or trucked in to, shop, to stores and shops and hospitals and then bought from there. So with no one being able to get in or out of Trizone, what the people have in terms of food, supplies, and necessities what they have is what they have, and when they run out, it doesn't deplenish, it doesn't replenish itself, right? And so they you know, cry out to, to frame Russia, saying, look, we're going to starve to death. We're all going to die if you don't get us the supplies necessary for survival. You know, you're not letting anybody bring them into us, so we need to be supplied them some way, somehow. And Russia says, not our problem. Not our fight, not our cause, not a. Which is like, I'm sorry, what now? So, these people in Berlin, or these people in Trizone, excuse me, are starting to starve to death. They're starting, oh, which map do I, we'll just do this one. They're, so, they're starting to starve to death. They're getting sick. They don't have medicine. And they start to cry out for help to anybody willing to help them. Which, obviously, this will be brought to the attention of President Truman, right? Now, again, each country has owned their own little small portion of Berlin. It's the circle right there in the middle for story's sake, right? Again, not geographically correct. This is for our story's sake, so you get the point. So Truman says, we're not just going to let these people die in vain. We're not going to let this happen to the people of Trizone. 
of Germany, right? This is not their fault, and we're not going to let them be victimized. So, we're going to get them the food and the supplies they need some way, somehow. We can't get in by land because Russia has it completely blocked, right? Can't get in by land. But they can't stop us by air, right? They can't stop us by air. No ifs, ands, or buts. So, we know we can fly over the area of Trizome, but does it make sense? If we're going to fly and drop, basically, long story short, fly over Trizome and drop the goods they need in by air, does it make sense for us to come way out here towards the border of Trizone and fly all these missions and be in the airspace for basically as long as humanly possible and be inside Trizone where they can see us and possibly shoot us down? Or does it make sense to go... Fly through Berlin, you know, get in and out before people even realize that we're there, right? We can fly in you know, to the city of Berlin, controlled by Russia. We can, you know, you know, fly in, drop goods, and be out before A, we're noticed. And B, if we are noticed, they won't have time to do anything about it. It's a quick in and out. And all the goods that, we, that the people of Berlin need will be dropped into that little corner portion of Berlin. Or excuse me, the, LP, the goods that the people of Trizo need will be dropped into the portion of Berlin controlled by the Russia, and then the people in Berlin can distribute it out. Shadow, you can come here. Shadow. No, not so much. Okay, on your time. So then they can distribute it out from Berlin to all the people who need it. Hopefully this makes sense, right? Because it works in 270 different missions. Over a ton, one ton, or one, excuse me, one million tons, one ton, one million tons of goods will be dropped in 270 different flights. Charles Lindbergh, by the way, flew in this. Into the city of Tri Berlin and Trizone. People are distributed out. And Russia basically finally figures out eventually they have been duped. They have been beat. It makes absolutely no sense for them to continue to block off all foot traffic. And eventually they will lift. I need another map. I need too many maps now. They will lift all road traffic, because there's no point, right? The people of Trizone are getting everything that they need. Having all road access cut off is not doing anybody any good. Eventually, they will lift the foot traffic. Things will go back to normal, right? But we'll still have Bizonia. We'll still have the three world powers, Britain, France, and the United States, controlling their country together. We'll still have Trizone, but everyone can go in. Everyone can go out. Russia will just have to admit the fact they were duped. And it's a huge win, right? Not only do we save the people of Germany, save the people of Trizone from a horrible, awful, you know, slow, traumatic depletion, but we show Russia, <laughs> you want to think you're smart? Look who's smarter, right? We, you know, you want to throw a curveball at us? We'll figure it out. So it was a huge victory for the moment, but again, like, Truman doesn't have long to revel in his presidential victory due to the Berlin airlift. Well, then Truman didn't have long to revel in the Berlin airlift due to the fact that not long after, there will be... My hair is doing its natural funky thing. We're just going to put that up today because it looks like I don't know how to brush my hair. Even though it has been brushed, it's... I hate having humid curly hair. Anyway, so... Not long after the Berlin airlift, we have a YouTube spy plane. It'll fly... Oh, that didn't look good either. Oh, well, I give up. My hair looks messy. Just see what, I just have to deal with it. I know y'all don't care. I care. That's okay. Anyway. Girls, you understand. Anyway. An American spy plane that, were, that was flying over the deserts of Kavakistan, which is a desert in Russia, detects a large amount of, radio of radiation. Radioactive frequency. And if this plane picks up a ridiculously large amount of radiation, that can only mean one thing. Something has been dropped, right? There's got to be a reason for all this radiation to be, you know, flowing through the atmosphere. And again, it means one thing. Russia has successfully created their own atomic bomb and is testing it, right? The way we tested ours in the Manhattan Project, Russia is testing theirs, which we were really naive, guys. We were really arrogant 
and really naive because again, don't forget the atomic bomb was one of the big things that started the whole Cold War, you know, irritation off in the first place. Stalin was ticked off that we weren't sharing our nuclear weapon recipe with them. But we were also incredibly naive because we had this ridiculous per, you know, perception that we would be untested. We would be unmirrored in this technology for at least a decade. We didn't believe for a dang minute that anybody would be able to you know, figure out how to build their own atomic bomb for at least 10 years. We would be alone in this technology for at least a decade. We absolutely believed it. Which was really arrogant and naive and just not wise to, to have that type of confidence. Because guess what? It's been, what, a few years? Just, you know, one or two, three years? Russia's figured it out. And they're testing it. And the only reason you test it is to ensure it works because you're planning on dropping it. Right? So this is a wake-up call. This is a huge wake-up call for our country. This is a huge huge red flag for our country and now Truman has to act accordingly right Truman now has to start to accept the fact a nuclear war might be a possibility like a reality it had always been a possibility he has to accept the fact now that it's a probable reality and oh gosh so he's got to first act in a military fashion per se once we know that they obviously have created one Militarily, he's going to put us on track to defend ourselves. We're going to do such things as try and stockpile. We're going to create as many atomic bombs as humanly possible and stockpile them. First saying, basically create an assembly line. And no, not an actual assembly line, but you get the point. Um, we're going to just crank out as many atomic bombs successfully and, create and, and, and correctly as we can. And at this point, we're also going to ask one of our now foreign allies, aka Turkey, if we can dream, if we can stockpile and store all our atomic weapons in their country, so that just in case we go to war and have a nuclear war with Russia, Turkey is our closest ally land location in that part of the world to where we know that we could actually launch a, uh, a bomb from and successfully hit them. So we're going to stockpile and hide all of our atomic bombs in Turkey. We're going to be cranking them out left and right due to the fact that if Russia hits us with one, we won't be able to hit them with five. They drop two on us, we won't be able to hit them with ten. Right? That type of persona. Not only that, Truman tell or you know, um, has the military start to work on creating this type of thing called the H bomb. The hydrogen bomb. Which, if you think about it, is just crazy. Can you imagine a bomb that was a thousand times more powerful? than the regular atomic bomb. Think about the atomic bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. And then Hiroshima. Well, backwards order, but you get the point. We dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, we dropped it on Nagasaki in World War II. And just think of the devastating results, the absolutely devastating results that that had. And now imagine a bomb that can do a thousand times more damage than that. The hydrogen bomb, hashtag the H-bomb. So he starts milit Hi honey, you gonna come see me now? He starts to work on militarily protecting ourselves, you know, gearing our military for war if need be. But also he's got to educate the American people on what hey, not only is this a probability, it could be a reality. And what to do to protect yourselves and what you could do to protect yourself if we got to this point, right? Come on. Yes or no? Uh, no, Mama's busy. Come here. Dear. There you go. See? Happy girl. <clears throat> so, he team would we do it for American people if, sorry, distracted. Cat in the left. Uh, if, we, we, if, you, if a drop bomb is dropped, you can survive it, right? You can, it's not a death sentence per se. No, it's actually hilarious. Also, you know, from starting with Truman in the late 1940s, all the way through Eisenhower, who was president for eight years in the 1950s, got elected in 1952, got elected in 1956. Uh, phenomenal president. We don't talk about him a lot in this section of the Cold War, basically for the sense that you read about him on your own in Chapter 28, the 1950s. So, which is what your last, last book quiz of the semester will be over. 
So you'll read and be educated on Eisenhower basically on your own a lot. And again, phenomenal human being, phenomenal man, phenomenal leader, very well loved. Uh, but will be president for eight years during the Cold War, and you'll see all of the things that he does during that time frame as well. Um, and there's things that he will do to educate and then take care of the American people during that time span. There are these videos. I highly recommend you go on YouTube, and if you've never heard of Bert the Turtle or the video of Duck and Cover, I highly recommend you go check it out because A, it's hilarious. Plus, it's 1950, so, you know, 60, you know, some 60 some odd years later. Well, I guess almost 70 something years later at this point. Almost 70 something years later, you look back at it and you watch this video and you're like, that's the dumbest crap I've ever heard. But if you keep in mind real time, that the, my, when, you know, what we knew in that day and age, people really did believe it. So there's this video, it's called Duck. Go on YouTube, look up Birth the Turtle Duck and Cover, watch the cartoon. It's hilarious in this day and age. But, again, it was one of our ways we could hide. We could educate ourselves on what to do, possibly, if a bomb is dropped. But on top of that, if a bomb is dropped and it explodes, the, re the radiation goes what direction? It goes out and it goes up, right? So if a bomb is dropped, you can survive it if you go down, which we will do. I mean, so that we will print these pamphlets and we will have all of these this, these books and these pamphlets printed that basically will teach you how to build a fallout shelter. If, you know, somewhere down on the ground, if the bomb is dropped, you can survive it, right? So, no, they're not, we're not going, no, the government's not going to pay to build you, build you fallout shelters, but they did create all these books and pamphlets that you could buy, teach you how to do it, teach you how to successfully do it, how much it was going to cost, cost about a fourth, you know, to build an adequate fallout shelter, I'm talking. It costs about a fourth of a family's annual income from $1,000 to seven or 8000 depending on how grandiose you want to make it. Why? But, so all of these things that Truman did, and then Eisenhower after him, again, we really don't talk much about Eisenhower in this lecture slash PowerPoint, but again, because you will be educated greatly on him on your own during chapter 28. And we don't talk about him because we don't love him. I love Eisenhower. I think he's great, right? But, anywho, so, you know, which Eisenhower does precede Truman as president. Truman fulfills the rest of his second term, and he is ready to step down, per se. Now, he does contemplate, he does momentarily try to run, you know, think about contemplating and trying to run again. But at this point, he's also been president for basically eight years, right? He served three years and, like, what, ten months, eleven months of Roosevelt's fourth term. He's been president... Um, of the United States, he does contemplate running, but it's not to be. He also will, he will not receive a third term. Eisenhower will be elected to replace him, who is a Republican, very, very well loved, runs under the slogan, I like Ike, World War II world hero, very well versed, very well educated in, the, in you know, governmental affairs, um, leads us through eight more years of this Cold War. And it is during, you know, so the Cold War amps up, there are some things that happen. NATO was formed in the 1950s, by the way. Uh, Turkey joins that right off the freaking bat. Eisenhower does a lot in terms of leading us through this Cold War as the threat of a nuclear war becomes more and more real. But not so, and you will read about him mostly on his own. I know I keep saying that, but what we will talk about during Eisenhower's presidency um, in terms of technology and the, this situation with Russia, not all was bad. There was actually something that happened during Eisenhower's presidency that, in terms of, you know, this, uh, you know, a competition in a race between Russia and the United States, something actually happened that was good. The start of the space race was created. There were, you know, while both countries were in this race to produce a nuclear bomb, both countries are also in this unspoken race between each other to get the first satellite into outer space, to be able to launch the first satellite into orbit and go explore outer space. There's a race going on between these two countries to be the first to do that in Russia. During Eisenhower's presidency in the late 1950s, Eisenhower will win. Eisenhower will win. Oh my dear God. Russia will win. Russia will successfully send up the first satellite into orbit known as Sputnik 1. It's about, the, it looks like a beach ball. It's a very heavy beach ball. 184 pounds. Like, holy freaking crap, right? But so it's, it's about big round orbit. It's got these long four tentacles that come off of it. Uh, antennas per se. But... Weight has no meaning in space. 
there is no gravity. So Sputnik 1 is successfully launched into outer space by the Russians um, in 1957 and 56, 57, 1957, 57, and was successfully orbited the Earth in 98 minutes. Not bad for a 184-pound beach ball, right? But so we've been working on a satellite to launch in orbit too. Ours was named Vanguard, V-A-N-G-U-A-R-D. But we could just could not get it up and running. We couldn't get it where we wanted it. We could not get it to where we needed it to be. And when Russia beats us to the space race, they successfully launch uh, Sputnik 1 into orbit. We throw Vanguard in the trash. We start all over. So throughout, you know, you know not, throughout 1957, we're building, working on a new satellite. But we also, it launches us, you know, Sputnik 1 launched into outer, launched, being launched into outer space actually begins the launch of the space race itself. For not only are we working on a brand new satellite to hopefully launch into orbit, we go on to create things like NASA, which was opened in 1958 in Cape Canaveral down in Florida. And by the end of 1958, we also finally have our own satellite that, we're, that we do successfully get up into outer space. It's called the Explorer 1. Um, I have a picture of Sputnik 1 in my PowerPoint. I took out the picture of the Explorer 1 because it got lots of blanks and giggles throughout time. It, a very interesting look considering in this day and age. Um, we'll say it resembles something like a flute. A very special looking flute. I'm sure most of us get the uh, point. If you want to see, hi, if you want to see what it looks like, you're more than welcome to go online and look it up. But this will lead into, so we have, you know, they, Rush will beat us. We beat them to atomic bomb. They beat us to satellite. But Sputnik 1 goes in outer space. Explorer 1 goes in outer space. NASA is opened. We continue to build new satellites. Uh, so Explorer 2 is sent up. We send up, uh, or Sputnik 2 is sent up. We send up Explorer 2. We start to spend, send up satellites into orbit with animals to see if life can survive in space. The Russians send up a monkey. The monkey does survive, comes back alive. We send up a dog. Unfortunately, bless our heart, the dog dies in outer space, comes, does not come back alive. But again, it launches us into that whole new universe, that whole new direction. So there is some good that comes between this, this you know, rivalry, per se, between Russia. Hello again. Are you back? Right, come on. All the way, please. All the way would be great in this, honey. Or not, whatever. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so. I'm trying to do lecture. You are not helping. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, all the, this, this competition between Russia and the United States, not all of it was bad. There was some good that did, in fact, come from it. But... Again, so that happened during Eisenhower's presidency as much as many, many more. Again, he's elected in 52 and 56. 1960 comes, and it's a little interesting. Eisenhower most likely would have run for a third term and would have run. Kind of hands down type of situation. Eisenhower, however, will be the first president not allowed to run for a third term. After FDR passes away, it is decided to put a cap on the presidential limit. FDR had been great. I mean, every president has his critics who go online, and there will be those who, who have a problem with some of the things that happened during his presidency. But overall, I mean, great, it's president of the 1900s. You can't take that away from me. Um, but not every, but considering it showed how long he was president and everything that happened in that time frame, and, and we started thinking about the possibilities, and not all presidents... You are really just being a problem right now. Not all presidents would be are going to be as great as FDR. So it's decided to, you know, considering, you know, we would put everything into perspective. It is decided to officially put a permanent cap on the presidential election. How many times a president can be elected? And since no president had ever served more than two up until FDR, it is decided that two is the magic number. So... You know, this goes through Congress, the law is passed. And so President so Eisenhower was the first president in American history who was held to that two term limit. He could no longer ever run again for a third, the way we've seen some people do in the past. So he's sure he served his two terms, he's done, he steps down, good to go. Meaning the door is left wide open for brand new candidates. And everyone assumes, well, Eisenhower cannot be reelected. His vice president will just take his place. This Republican by the name of Richard Nixon. 
Richard Nixon had what was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, he was, you know, well into his 40s, um, or excuse me, can't talk right now, he's well into his 40s, he's very experienced, he's very qualified, he served in Congress for years upon years, uh, he's been the vice president under Eisenhower for the last eight years, he's, hi, he's very well versed, he's very well aware of everything going on in politics, he could not be more informed on the Cold War, um, he's, he's just, it makes absolute complete sense for him to step, Eisenhower to step down and Nixon to step into his shoes. And everyone thinks he's got this in the bag, by the way, people, especially considering who the Democratic candidate is. This young feller by the name of John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy. His father, I mean, his life, the, the Kennedy brothers, Robert and John, their life was basically set in stone for the moment they were born. The Ken Kennedys, you know, Kennedy Sr. always had intention for one of his children to get into the Oval Office. He never got that shot. He never got into the Oval Office. So it was the destiny of his children to become President of the United States. He was going to make sure it happened, push them in that direction, make sure that became a reality. So, bless us, sorry. So, FDR, FDR, <laughs> JFK, JFK, he's young. He's only 42. Um, same age as, as Teddy Roosevelt when he assumes the presidency. Kennedy served in World War II. He joined the Navy and actually was injured in the Navy, was, was in a battle in which his ship was sunk. He obviously survives, but comes out of it with a horrific back injury, by the way, which plagued him his entire life. But he, so he served in the military. He relieves the military. His father pushes him into Congress, and he has served. He has served in, served in Congress for just a few years. Nothing major, still considered an experience, still considered one of the youngsters and the rookies. While Eisenhower has served, Eisenhower, while Nixon has served in Congress for years, was very well established in Congress, you know, had, had served, served his time, now been president, you know, been part of this huge governmental plat platform, had been vice president for eight years. Next to JFK, as, I mean, Nixon is the polished veteran professional. Kennedy is this, Kennedy is this young rookie. Right? So right off the bat, his age and inexperience are going to work against him in this election. Not... You are just moody today. Good lord. I swear she's really sweet most of the time. She's having a moment. Anywho. So his age and inexperience are working against him right off the bat. But also, here's an interesting side note. Also, his faith. The Kennedys are hardcore... Devoted Catholic. Uh, Kennedy Sr. and his wife, the, you know, John F. Kennedy's parents, are, are incredibly devout Catholics. Which, by the way, is great. Not a problem in the freaking world. Uh, Kennedy's not as hardcore devout as his parents, but he still considers himself a, really, you know, a, a devoted Catholic. And, again, that's great. That's, you know, hey, not a problem in the world with that. I think that's phenomenal. What's the, what is the problem with it? In fact, he's Catholic. Guys, 70, well, at this point, 60 years ago, this was an insanely devoted Christian country. And there was a huge fear of having a Catholic. What's the Catholic faith? This part of the Christian faith, that we get the point. But, you know, we were looking at Lutherans and Baptists and, and Protestants. Having a Catholic be, it was a huge problem because of who, if you were Catholic, who... The number one, the, the number one human being in the world that you followed, aka if you're Catholic, your number one human that you follow is you know the Pope in terms of religious ordeals and teaching. God comes first, but in terms of human, you listen to the Pope, right? Well, the Pope is a European figure, right? And he was he, and he, he and it's, it's not an American. He, he's not an American citizen. It, it, the Pope comes from a, this real this European religion, and there was a huge fear that Kennedy would, in fact, put the Pope and the Pope's wishings and teaches and direction ahead of what was best for America. American goals, values, ideals, needs, wants, etc., etc., were very, very different than Europe's. But there was a fear that Kennedy would put too much faith in the, what the Pope told him to do and not run this country accordingly. That might sound silly, 
to us 60 years later. But again, go back to real time. Go back to that day and age where that was the mentality of our country. I mean, the mentality of our country today probably will seem silly to people 60 years from now. So in real time, it was a genuine, serious concern. And I mean, the fact that he was Catholic cost him, guys, his faith alone cost him a million votes. A million people said they did not vote for him because he was Catholic. I mean, so it was real. It was a real concern in this country. But inexperienced Catholic, which was a problem in that day and age, um, young, but he still wins. Spoiler alert, hopefully we know, Kennedy wins. Why though? Why is the question? Because of TV. Guys, TV came out in 1948. But it wasn't until the 1950s, actually because out before that, because there's a few footages of FDR on TV. So 1940, it had come out in 1945, but I mean, it becomes available to the public. It, it, it gets exposed and becomes a consumer product in 1948. But it's again, it's kind of like the radio. It's, it takes a while to kind of catch on, and then there's several renditions of it, etc., etc. We continue to make it better and better. So the TV really is seen as a technological innovation of the 1950s. Um, it's one of the biggest technological innovations of the 1950s, which there's a lot. You'll see as you read chapter 28, there are a lot. We have like things like garages, refrigerators, microwaves, vacuum cleaners, etc., etc. But the TV probably is one of the biggest, hands down, bar none. So throughout the 1950s, you know, the TV continued to get tweaked, became better and better molds. By 1960, every home had a TV in it, right? Um, you will see, once you read chapter 28, there are the first ever TV shows that come out. I love Lucy. Leave it to Beaver. Father knows best. Um, which one am I leaving on? The Partridge? No, not the Partridge. Leave it to Beaver. I love Lucy. Father knows best. Um, oh dear God. It'll come to me here in a minute. Another big one. But anywho, the Honeymooners. The Honeymooners also came out in the 1950s. There you go. But anyway, so by 1960, you could watch, everyone was watching the presidential debates on TV. And the TV will elect. President Kennedy. Kennedy is very good looking. He is fit. He is tan. He's got a pretty face. He is very, very attractive. And he is that type A alpha, very confident, center of the room, life of every party, just very, very, very comfortable and chaos in this, you know, and with all this attention and the lights and the people and the cameras and the action and very well versed. Very well spoken, very confident. Makeup, you know, suited his features per se. And Kennedy will thrive under the lights of the TV cameras. Well, Nixon, not so much. Nixon, hey, by the way, he just come off a knee surgery. Not only did he come off a knee surgery, he had been taking this train tour across the country, campaigning for president. So if you put, you know, his he he's tired. He look, you know, he's haggard. He's not in the best of health. Um, plus, he's not the type of person, the makeup did not look well on him. The makeup, makeup, makeup made him look old. But it said that he was very uncomfortable around all the people and the lights and the cameras and all the activities. It said he sweated profusely under the hot camera lights. He was distracted and very uncomfortable with all the commotion going on behind the scenes that we as viewers don't see. And so he kind of was, he came off as old. He came up as tired, haggard, uncomfortable, just not on his game. Well, Kennedy was very poised. He was looking straight into that camera. He was absolutely doing his thing and absolutely took control of the situation on TV. So if you ask people who listen to the presidential debates on radio, I almost said camera, on radio, they would hand Nick's Richard Nixon. The election. You talk to those who watched the debates on TV, they hated Kennedy in the election. So it all came down to the vote. And when the votes came in, guys, 68 million votes cast. Out of 68 million, Kennedy won 100,000 more. 0.2% of the popular vote awarded Kennedy the election. The presidential election of 1948, biggest upset in American history, biggest or closest presidential election, 1960, 0.2% of a vote.
Hence, Kennedy the election. If we had not had TV, if those debates had not been on TV, Kennedy would have won. Excuse me, good God. <laughs> Nixon would have won, and we would not have had a President Kennedy. It's interesting to think about. It's, it's pretty dang interesting. If, if Nixon had been president during the 1960s and not during Vietnam, things, you know, and a few years later in Vietnam, things may have been very different. So it's just one of those interesting scenarios that history worked out the way it was supposed to, considering of how everything went down, but it's fascinating. So, Kennedy, by the way, elected in 1960, will assume the presidency in 1961, basically is president for less than three years, spoiler alert, before he's assassinated, he's assassinated November 22nd, 1963. But man, did he have a full action-packed, traumatic few years in office. Because as soon as he takes over role, he's dealing with the Cold War. And the last event we're going to talk about, because I'm starting to get a little paranoid, it's about this time that huh, my both lectures last night cut off and I can't post either one of those videos because they're quote, quote, corrupt, apparently. Um, we'll get through the Berlin Wall and I'll, I'll quit this out of paranoia. But, anywho, talking to myself, he doesn't have long to revel in his victory because as soon as he takes office, he's dealing with the Cold War. And this event that's going to transpire, the last thing we're going to talk about in this video lecture called the Berlin Wall. But he's also dealing with Vietnam and the events that are transpiring over there. He's also dealing with civil rights. I mean, there's so many other things that happen that we don't talk about and we kind of take, that we forget that everything he dealt with in those few short years. So there's areas where he's praised for, there are areas he's criticized, criticized for, but he did they dealt with more in two and three fourths years than some presidents do in their entire term, right? But regardless, so when he takes office very, very quickly, comes out the news of 1961 of the rise of the Berlin Wall. Are you back? Are you going to be nice this time? You're moody today. You're moody today. Come on. Pick your spot. Are you good? Hmm? Can you let me finish my lecture really fast? Pretty please? So, here's the deal, guys. This goes back to our maps. Don't get mad at me if I smush you. Go back to Bizonia and Trizone, right? It's still been that way. We've lifted the foot traffic, right? Everyone can get in, everyone can go out of Bizonia and Trizone. Uh, there's been no foot traffic up until this point. But, Trizone has still been ruled as a Russian country. It's still communist, and it's the people who live in Trizone are still suffering. Again, being held to about 900 calories a day. Pay is not good. Jobs are menial. You have no rights. You don't feel like anybody cares about you. There's no money to be had. Life is hard. But right across the road over in Bazonia, life is good. There are jobs to be had. There is money to be made. Life is, is beneficial. There's every reason in the world to love living in Bizonia. So it starts out where people who lived in this little area of Germany called Trizone would commute over into Bizonia for work. Do you know about Bizonia and Trizone? No? Yes? They would commute into Bizonia for work. So they would, you know, it's kind of like the people who, you know, because I live almost, I live over in Fort Worth area. I live in Benbrook. But there's so many people that I know that live in Fort Worth who commute to Dallas every day. And oh my God, if you can do that, God bless you. Going to Dallas, twi or going to and from Dallas twice a day <laughs> at rush hour, God bless you. You are way be a better person than I am because I can't deal with that traffic. Uh -uh. Kind of the same thing. They live in Trizone, but they're working in Trizonia, making a long commute. But of course, you know, for better pay. But then life overall, I mean, being taken care of, laws, rights, livelihoods, jobs, economics, everything in Bizonia is better than life in Trizone. So while you may have lived there in your fourth generation, you know, German who lived in that, you know, your great-great-grandparents built the house you live in type of thing. After a while, it's like, why do we still live here? Life sucks. The people who are ruling us, they don't care about us. They don't give a damn about us. They're, I, what is going on? Why are we still here? And they just, there's a lot, there are millions of people and Trizone, who say, screw this, we're going to Bazonia. We're just moving. We're out. We're done. Peace, right? 
And so next thing you know, you've got hundreds of thousands of people at a time packing up and moving to a different portion of Germany where life is better, where jobs are to be had, where money is good, right? Makes actually complete and total freaking sense, doesn't it? But on the flip side, all of a sudden, with so many people moving to Bazonia, well, Trizone, the Russian portion of Germany, is losing its labor force. It's losing its labor force. It's absolutely, you know, the you know the people are it's depleting of people, and we still need labor to keep this portion of Germany going. Well, Russia didn't like it. Russia didn't like the fact that it's losing its labor force. Russia didn't like what's happening here, so Russia is going to make a move to hopefully keep its labor force intact. And I might have to draw myself another map here. Where is my one from last night? I think I've already drawn all over it today. Yep, that's okay. Ugh. As long as my cat didn't get mad and I'm disturbing her, God forbid. Alright, so. Once again, we got Trizone. We got Bizonia. We've got... See, I need a whiteboard. I need to put a whiteboard in my freaking apartment. So. But. If Russia is going to make a move to keep and control its labor force, it's got to be something drastic. This can't be a slow fade because, again, it's a slow fade. Well, then the Allied powers can bound together and find a way to stop them. Stop whatever they're doing. Oh, I guess I could have used that map. Oh, well. So, they got to make a drastic move to try to trap in and control its labor force. So, long story short, in the uh, 1961, in the late night hours of August 12th into the early morning hours of August 13th, trucks are going to rumble through. She's going to yell at me here in a minute. I can hear it. Just that portion of Berlin, that portion that I have highlighted, I don't know if you can really see it, in green, that portion of Berlin controlled by Trizone, that little portion up there in the corner. I know, there we go. I knew that was coming. And trucks, you know, with soldiers are going to rumble through Berlin, and just that portion of Berlin that I've highlighted, they're going to fence in. Berlin is the capital. Berlin is the most important part of Trizone. Berlin is where most industry is located. That is where they need to control their labor force. So, uh, so throughout the late night hours of August 12th into the morning hours of August 13th, a wall, a barbed wire wall, will be put up around this portion. Thank you. This portion of Berlin. And what people the people will be boxed in. Will be trapped in. And whatever... You are so moody today. They're not going to think you're nice. Whatever side of the wall you fell asleep on that night, the night of August 12th, you woke up the morning of August 13th, whatever side of the wall that you were on is where you will remain for 28 years. The older than most of you, people. 28 years. Nobody was allowed to come in. Nobody allowed to go out of that portion of Berlin, that portion of Berlin. Can you imagine? I mean, what if you live in, in Bizonia and your parents live in Trizone? Go with me. Just throwing out an example. And you, the more so, your your husband, your kids, your job, your livelihoods, your everything was in Bizonia. You were just visiting your parents for the night. You decided to spend the night. You wake up in the morning. You're fenced in. It didn't matter if you live in Bizonia. It doesn't matter if you live in another area of Trizone. If you were inside that portion of Berlin where the wall went up, you were not, allow not allowed to leave. You were going to remain there for 30, 30, good God, 28 years. What if you lived in Trizone and your husband, your your sickly, your elderly husband or your parents or, you know, you were in Bizonia because your kid had an away game. And then, so you were over in Bizonia and you got a hotel room, go with me. This for the night, you were going to return home to Berlin the next day. Well, it doesn't matter if you lived there. Quit. Quit eating your foot. It didn't matter if you lived there. Again, your husband, your kids, your job, your livelihood. Doesn't matter. You were going to, whatever side of the wall that you were on the morning of August 13th is where you would remain for 28 years. Now, I have a picture of it, and it's really fascinating to see. I have a little picture of it in my PowerPoint on Canvas for you of a portion of the wall that still remains today. 
Um, when it went up in 1961, it was literally this tall barbed wire fence. I mean, it was an overnight chop chop, let's get this thing up, get this party started type of scenario. And initially, people were able to get through it because it was just a barbed wire fence. So you could ram your car through it, you could break it down, you could climb over it, etc., etc. So as the years went on, the wall became more intricate. Oh, and I don't have my freaking phone, do I? No, I don't. I think it's in my room. Which I have, I have my description, if I can remember off the top of my head, everything. So this barbed wire fence, by 28 years later, had become a 20 foot high concrete wall, thick concrete wall, with an inner wall also. And on either side of this 25 foot high, thick concrete wall, and on either side was a 300 foot no man's land, which bombs and IEDs were buried to keep you from wanting to cross it. There were anti-vehicle trenches. There were uh, watch light towers, so they could, you know, the, the whole thing was lit up so they could see at night. There was barbed wire and electric fences strung across the top of the wall. There were anti-vehicle trenches. Soldiers that would patrol with attack dogs. Um, I mean, all of these intricate things. It was like a prison. Like a prison wall. All of these intricate things to keep people from trying to and keeping them from, from getting over it. I mean, it would became this crazy scenario to ensure that people could not get over the wall. Um, which they didn't, by the way. I mean, tele telegraph and telephone wires were cut, so, so communication could not be an issue. I mean, it was just insane. And actually, I remember last night, I'm going to put it up this morning, by the way. I mean, I'm going to add an extra clip to watch for you on under modules, because the wall stood for 28 years. Most people, 98% of people, were trapped on or in that in the city of Berlin who were in there when they fell asleep the night of August 12th most people remained in that portion of Berlin for 20 years the wall comes down 1989 1990 Germany is reunited into a whole collective front then you know it goes from we quit having East and West Germany Trizona and Bizonia in 1919 we will be completely uh, reunited into just the country of Germany and their ABC did this huge news coverage of the day the wall came down. And all these people who were there who were, I mean, there were thousands of people who were there who were waiting to witness the gates be let open. And these people who have been inside for 20 years get to come through to the other side for the first time in almost 30 years. I'm going to put it, I'm going to find it today. I can find it on YouTube, I think. If not, I can find it on ABC.com. Um, of the footage of it. And it's just, it's just fascinating um, to really witness it prime time but to get 98 percent of the people are so remains there for 28 years there are a few stories of people who are able still to get across even with all the extensiveness to keep them locked inside there are people about pe the story of people who built dug a tunnel which took forever because can you imagine if you dug this tunnel they broke down the walls of their basement you know used sledgehammers to break through the concrete until they hit dirt and then dug a tunnel all the way to the other side which, can you imagine if you dug this tunnel when you popped up thinking you were on the other side, you came up on the same side of the wall? That would have been awful. But there's stories of people who dug this tunnel, and then there's a story of a family who fashioned themselves their own hot air balloon and successfully floated over the Berlin Wall. There's pictures of that you can find on the internet as well, of the Berlin Wall hot air balloon. Just Google it. It's interesting. Um, so there, but again, so it's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. But the wall goes up during Kennedy's first term, or first year into his term. And we only really start going term. Um, but it went into it first year, so he's having to deal with that. And then Kennedy also deals with the height of the Cold War. He deals with the Bay of Pigs, which was a horrible scenario. And he also dealt with the Cuban Missile Crisis. But I'm looking at my, I'm getting a little paranoid, because this is where I made it both times last night before my computer fritzed out. So I'm just out of paranoia. Gonna, we're going to stop here. We still have to hit the Berlin Wall, or the Bay of Pigs, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, but I will put those few slides for you. It's only like seven slides, eight slides. Uh, put those up for you on Canvas for you to look over for those on your own. Um, and when I see you next time, we will pick up with civil rights. Have a good rest of your weekend, people. Stay warm. It's freaking cold out there. Beep, beep.